for the Penang players, by the way. <laughs> Friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, well, we are a very small group, but uh, don't let the numbers spoil the quality of the evening. Uh, my name is Gary Richards. Most of you, I think, do know me from Gorokodaya Workshop. And this is my partner in crime, uh, Xiao Wun, from the Main Institute. We, uh, we are, for the first time, we are uh, breaking the habits of a lifetime because we've always been in the star building, as you know. And it was going to be an experiment to see how many thousands of people would actually turn up uh, on a Saturday night here. But it's an unfair uh, call because there are so many competing uh, events to do the festival going on at the moment. Now, I think all those other people have made the wrong choice, but still, you can't blame them too, too, too much. And then, Peter was telling me, she asked all kinds of friends to come along tonight, and when she said the word poetry, they said, Thanks for the Thanks for the <laughs> Quantity isn't everything, or as they say, size doesn't matter. Well, sometimes it doesn't matter, I mean, let's see. But we are a, a small group, so a very, very, very warm welcome. And of course, um, uh, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to be able to welcome the two young men sitting on my right. Uh, that's not their politics, by the way. They just happen to be sitting on my right. Not that friend of you. Well... <laughs> to be respectful. <laughs> um, on my immediate right, of course, you all recognize Wong Pinan, one of uh, Malaysia's uh, senior uh, poets. Although, like all great poets, you see, most great poets are not professors of literature like Edwin. You know, they have sensible jobs, like Philip Larkin, you know, he was a librarian. You, know. you work in an accountant's office. And then you go home and write this marvellous poetry without having to think about work. <laughs> Whereas Edwin, I mean, he brushes his teeth in the morning and he's thinking about literature. He goes for his favourite you know, curry in Bangsa, he's thinking about literature, <laughs> Tose, and so on. <laughs> um, so you are actually in finance, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, we for a long time. Yes, I don't know. Paper bills, anyway. <laughs> but uh, at least I'm aware of half a dozen collections dating back to the 1980s, or was it even earlier? When you picked up the 1960s. Oh my dear! <laughs> I stopped writing for a long time. Oh, I think, I, think I, I think that's what I call the part that you stopped writing. Yeah. <laughs> you need to read my uh, introduction to my bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and they're both embarrassing, you see. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, and also a playwright, of course. And uh, when, when we were putting together this session, uh, Edwin very much suggested that we now would be an excellent person to reflect upon and uh, engage with uh, the substance of tonight's talk. And on my far right, absolutely nothing to do with his politics. Is certainly not. <laughs> he says, protesting very loudly. Is the great. Uh, I've never known how to say your first name, is it, Malachi? Car. Malachi. Oh. Malachi. Malachi. So it's a hard CH. Yeah. As in Kai Square. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Like that, Edwin. Last chapter. Better money. Yes. yes. Last chapter of the New Testament. Oh, the Old yes. Testament. Old Testament. Oh, you see, you've got the wrong Testament. <laughs> Well, that, that one I did realize, but I never knew if it was a hard CH or a soft CH. So now I know. I think the Irish say it's a soft CH. The Irish say it's a soft CH. And they also spell it M A L E C H Y. Oh. You know the Irish. You have a big Yes, they have the God's gift of the gag, the Irish. <laughs> um, and as you all probably know, um, Edwin, a long-standing uh, bibliographer, a critic, one of the finest, but this is actually a collection of his own 
poetry. And he's, as they say, down with the kids. What do I mean by down with the kids? Well, he's an ardent follower of Facebook. And when you look on Facebook, on where you have to state your relationship, so you can say you're single, you can say you're married, or you can actually say it's complicated. So I think this is in honor of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just took my second paragraph. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> you really well. Yeah. Um, and actually, when the books came into the bookshop uh, a while ago, I, I spent a really delightful evening. i tell you how delightful it was. It meant I didn't have to edit somebody else's writing and spent a lovely evening. And uh, read it from cover to cover. You can even test me on it, like one of your undergraduate students. <laughs> so please give a very, very warm uh, and very exclusive welcome to Malakai Edwin. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, and thank you to the Penang Institute for this evening. And I also like to thank. Uh, for taking time to be with us today. Uh, someone asked me, you sure you want Puinam to be the discussant who's going to destroy you? <laughs> I said, well, if I survive Puinam, then I should be all right. <laughs> so, thank you so much and thank you uh, for being uh, here today. And as you will, I mean, uh, like Leela said, you know, you invite someone for poetry, they think you're asking them to drink poison or something. But I promise you we won't do anything of that sort. Um, poetry is something that has always been very close to my work and also to... Um, for me, well, in the sense that when I think of poetry, or when I think of literature, the first thing that comes to my mind is poetry. And I feel that when we talk about writing, <coughs> Uh, artistic uh, presentation of our feelings and thoughts. The even in the oral tradition, poetry was probably the first form of literary expression, and and therefore I think I've read quite a bit of poetry in my life as a student, uh, as a teacher, and I continue to enjoy poetry. And I thought, well, if, if that's something that I enjoy, then. I would also like to then present my thoughts uh, in, in the form of poetry, but I actually did not start my career as a writer, as a poet. I actually uh, wrote short stories first. And again, I was uh, in the middle of my PhD and I was stuck with chapter three or something. And I was really angry at myself. And, uh, Keith Wan Chai had just advertised, I think, that there was the NSD short story competition. And so uh, I said, okay, let me see, let's give it a shot. And I spent the next three days writing the short story and I sent it in and very pleasantly surprised that I actually won a consolation prize. <laughs> okay, that was hope yet. Uh, I actually uh, write quite a bit of short stories, but I haven't published them. I was going to publish them later this year, but I got myself into another project which uh, we will launch in November. Called, um, this is again related to the work that I do with uh, my bibliography. So I think I have a kind of institution, institutional memory of Malaysian poets uh, and where it started and how it's heading. And so I'm, I'm putting together a volume of Malaysian poems from the early 1960s right up to the present period. Uh, and I expect it to be around 250 to 300 pages. And uh, it's only works which have been published because you know there's so much writing that's coming out and uh, I, I, I call that uh, this is the criteria. So I, you can tell by that that I'm very much involved in the, the kind of work that poets do. And today, uh, it's amazing that the poetry scene 
at least in Kuala Lumpur, seems extremely lively with the young people known as the uh, spoken word poets. They are constantly speaking at people. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but it's, it's quite interesting. If you just type spoken word Malaysia on YouTube, you're going to find some interesting work. And therefore, I'm looking at that. But in terms of my own writing, um, when I decided, uh, it's not that you decide overnight that you want to become a poet. You write and then you put your work away. And I've been very fortunate in the sense that I've always had a, a good group of friends who were willing to read my work and tell me when it's working and when it's not. And therefore, it really helps um, to grow as a writer. So I think my first poem was actually published in 1989. And, and then I just published individually in various journals. Um, but I never thought that I would actually put together a volume of and it's only over the last maybe five years that I actually uh, was able to do that, uh, write more. And again, it doesn't really help being an academic, it actually works against you, like uh, Gareth, Gareth was saying. So, after I left UPM, I had more time. I thought I would get more time to write, but unfortunately I became an administrator. I was a dean of a school, of our son of an university, and later in Taylor's University. And uh, three years ago, I ended my career as administrator. Now I'm a professor in Nottingham, in the School of English, which is wonderful because it gives me a lot of time to write. So since I joined Nottingham, I think I published uh, the bibliography, which was sitting around waiting to be completed. I went on to publish uh, my volume of poems. Um, now working on two more projects. And hopefully, I will continue to work along those uh, lines because I, I find uh, I think academia is fine, but I, as you grow a bit older, you want to spend a bit more time with your own create creativity and not just on other people's work. So it's nice being a critic, but I think I'll take the risk of writing and letting other people also uh, critique me. Um, so. Again, the question of why poetry, because people don't actually want to read poems. Um, is there a market? I think people like Amir Mohammed with the Fixie and also uh, Rahman, who runs So the Fish, have said, don't send poetry to us, it doesn't make money. Uh, if your work is still remembered 20 years later, then you're a poet. So for now, don't give up your what your day job, and most of us have not given up our day jobs. Uh, so, in that sense, um, I would, I had to ask myself, if I write and I do want to reach an audience, will there be someone who will be willing to publish my work? And very fortunately, uh, Maya Press uh, agreed to publish my work. In fact, um, about eight, nine years ago, uh, I came up with a collection of Malaysian poems. It was actually targeted for the Malaysian schools. So, um, I, it was very thematically developed so that teachers could just pick it up and use it. Um, and I was very happy to see that three of the poems from that collection was actually selected for the secondary school uh, students. And people thought that I was going to be really rich because the ministry was going to pay these Writer, so I, and I told them, I just compiled their work and made it accessible. And fortunately, the money went to the poets. And rightly so. And you know, imagine uh, you write a poem 10 years ago, and then suddenly a check for 20,000 arrives. Seriously? Seriously. Uh, I didn't know that till I had a chat with uh, Sean, Dato Sean. His poem, uh, Air Conditioning, was one of those that were in there. And that works very well with young kids. You know, it's a dialogue between grandparents and all. So, uh, yes, once in a while you might get some money. Um, I remember putting another volume where Poinam's poems are there, but I, I think they gave him like 500 ringgit. <laughs> the spirit of the Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, that, again, uh, poetry does not make money. So, uh, But it's nice when you have a, a 
publisher who is willing to publish your work. And people ask, so how many books have you sold? I say, I'll be very lucky if I have sold a certain number of copies. And one thing is I have a good network of teachers with me. Uh, so in fact, it was very pleasing that um, the Form 6 students in Skola Mananga, something in Moa, bought 80 copies of Complicated Lives. I said, oh wow, yes. <laughs> because the teacher said, I read them and I said, I can work with my students on this. So I said, that's great. So, you know, so writing poetry is one thing. Writing poetry in English in Malaysia is yet another thing. You know, uh, the politics of our literary landscape, the rather you write in Malay. But I wasn't writing for anyone who to win the National Sastra Award or whatever. So it didn't bother me. But I think today we are luckier because there's so many avenues available for writers for us to publish. Uh, if, you, if you don't publish, for you to read. Uh, people like Sharon Barker have readings in Bangsa and all. And I think um, there are readings. Even in Kwan Tuan, we are like, having these reading circles, which is really nice to know. Uh, I was doing a research for one of my NSD articles. In fact, uh, last month, my NSD article was on uh, who's afraid of poetry. I think just about everybody else seems to be afraid of poetry. Yeah. So, um, I, I decided that if I was going to write poetry, then I was going to write something that I'm familiar with, something that concerns me. And one of the things that concerns me is where is the Malaysian Indian placed in this literary landscape? Um, and, um, and therefore, even the, the first short story I wrote has uh, a strong Indian presence. I, you know, uh, saying that something that comes to my mind is how often um, K.S. Manian gets criticized because his is almost an Indian uh, canvas and therefore people say, you mean to say in Malaysia you only have Indians? Uh, <laughs> which is, well, you know, his, that was his preoccupation and I think in his later, some of his short stories he does the people from other cultures. So, if you, when you read my poems you can find that there's some which are very distinctly Indian with Christian presence because I grew up in a very strong Christian background, Methodist background. And interestingly enough, somebody met me the other day and said, I know all your brothers and sisters, I see them in church. But I've never met you. I said, yeah, that's because I don't go to church anymore. It was most upset. <laughs> so, not something that was pleasing. So, um, when I when I started writing that, therefore, I was concerned about my own identity, my relationships, uh, sense of loss, regain. So these are some of the things I, I work with. Uh, and the other thing is because we live such precarious lives with people who share their thoughts, their fears, and their pains. Uh, some of the poems are made may seem personal and in fact uh, at the back of the cover of the book uh, I think uh, those who were kind enough to say something about poems say this is memoir, these are recapturing of my own personal journey. I guess in some ways they are and you know, well at least when I am writing something I know that this is how it often moves from what might be me to someone else who I know of, has experienced the same thing, uh, and, and therefore, you know, it, the memory becomes slightly false in the sense that you incorporate other people's lives into your writing and therefore you share, uh, we have shared memories. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I've not actually been overly concerned with historical events or political events. And I often was interested more in the personal and the interpersonal. And there are some, uh, but you won't find the so-called multicultural uh, 
images, because I don't think there really are such things as multicultural images, but you will be you you recognize probably Malaysian life as it is contemporary life. And in fact, uh, Garrett mentioned a bit about the title of the book. And if you know today, if, when you're in social media, they ask you for relationships. So people say single, married, divorced, and a lot of people say complicated. And I thought that that actually represented uh, some of the things that I was dealing with because uh, our lives are no longer in binaries, they're in continuums, they are constantly shifting. So I'm going to capture some of that uh, in the poems. And later when I read that, maybe you'll, you'll find that uh, in what I was doing. So at, at the same time, um, if you're writing poetry and you're writing to a, not a large audience, you, one of the things I wanted to capture was that of, when someone reads this poem, will they get the sense as, oh, the poems do sound like Edwin, the poems, <laughs> this might reflect the style of writing. Um, I think I published about almost 100 poems, maybe about 80 poems in this collection, and I have maybe another 100 poems which I'm still working on. Uh, and therefore, hopefully after I've written like six volumes of poetry, then this idea of, oh, there is a style that's... Emerged. In the first book, you're going to get a glimpse of what I'm doing. Some things work, some things don't. And, and therefore, I hope that by having these sessions, meeting people, you know what works, because people come and I can tell you, you know, I connected with that, which, which is great. There are others which are a bit more distant. Um, maybe it'll, it'll work with some people, others won't. And I have a lot of friends who say, uh, so you're talking about this, right? And I, you know, I have a poem called, uh, which is entitled Adultery. And actually the title, Adultery itself, does not actually mean uh, a kind of marital relation, a kind of complication. So I was trying to be metaphorical and I hope I succeeded with some. So basically, uh, when I think of my poems, I think of them as capturing certain moments. And very often, some of them have been very painful. Uh, the first few poems that you will read will be are poems that are very much related with my relationship with my mother, which is ongoing despite the fact that she died seven years ago. You know, uh, and so there are certain things that deal with it. Uh, being a parent, uh, being uh, once married, once... So all these things which make us human, I think, are, are there. And uh, I'm also trying to capture certain things about contemporary life. And, and, and therefore, uh, you know, things are not as straightforward and easy as they are. Yeah. So I'm not going to tell you which, which poem means what, that you can work out yourself. I think as a reader, you need to work, uh, and I will tell. Uh, so maybe I'll just stop there now about the poems, and I'll read some poems to you, and we can come back and have some conversations. Yeah? If you have the book with you, the first poem I'm going to read is from page 85. It was a wondrous sight, a sight for national unity watches. He eating fried meat with chopsticks, and she nasi lemak with fingers. The young man skillfully maneuvered the chopsticks without letting slip a strand. The young woman expertly coordinated her hand and mouth, getting every grain in. The meal almost over. They make plans to tell their parents. The next poem is entitled Still Brook Fields. It's on page 39. I'm Brickfields born and bred, and therefore this poem. Still Brickfields. 
On Brickfield's old pavements now stand concrete, colorful arches, trying to give a semblance of an Indian enclave it once was. Buildings rise and spring at me. These monsters have devoured my playgrounds and past. My childhood church no longer stands alone. Now, surrounded by brothels and massage parlors. Yet, I still see my city's house, its huge garden of banana trees, playing with my cousins amidst the chickens and ducks. I still hear the sound of the ice cream man's bicycle bell. The roti man's blaring horn will follow. The Scott Road Hindu temple now stands but stripped of its peacock pants and rain trees. The river bank is concrete, the lala and weeds gone. The river bears a monsoon rain mask. There I once caught fish and saw floating corpses during the May riots that undid us. One by one, we were torn away. Then the big flood came and sealed our fate. Now, we return like tourists with our children. They wander on these small spaces we once called home. This is my Brickfields, never Central. Central is a new name given to the whole area, which is called Brickfields. <coughs> the next poem is called Beautiful Butterfly. It's the first poem uh, in this collection on page 13. Lying on my mother's bed, I watch her begin her Sunday morning ritual. She opens her cupboard, and before her lie shelves on neatly arranged saris, a splendid array of red, blue, and green, calling out to be worn. I never know how she chooses. I pick my favorite blue. She smiles and pays no heed. Freshly bathed with quaint modesty, she rushes into her bedroom. Now, with immaculate precision, she drapes her body with yards of cloth. Within minutes, she emerges, a beautiful butterfly. I no longer go into my mother's bedroom. She no longer wears saris. She's dressed in cotton curtains. My mother's saris sit quietly on the shelves on her cupboard. And they, are they still calling out to be worn? I know the next time I see her in a sari, she will not be that tall, lovely lady. She will be lying small and shriveled in her final bed. The next poem uh, I've chosen is called It's Complicated, from which the title actually comes from. It's on page 49. Our lives a mess, so we fashionably say it's complicated. We still hold hands in the car, you gently remove yours, steer the car, and return it as before. But it is not as before. The years have been good to us. Yet, when I have your hand in mine, I wonder if it is mine you feel, or another's. I know every line in your slightly coarse palm, the calluses, and soft ridges. What do you feel, my love? I remember when we were not complicated, in love and loved. Now, we love, but we're not quite in love. We have not moved on and have chosen to stay. Untangling is not a choice. Complicated is difficult. But we will manage complicated and love the way only we can.
let me read to you this poem, uh, which uh, is very much a uh, Christmas setting. It's called One Christmas Morning, page 30. The smell of curries and familiar kitchen sounds of Pati, Amma, and my sisters have awakened me. My younger brother, already about, caught up with his presence, opened at midnight by the Christmas tree, has no time for me. Anand has wished on the gramophone, and Pat Boone sings carols that he'll be home for Christmas, though not my sister, away in a distant land. The smells of curry and ghee rice waft through the house. Guests will arrive, but not yet. Appa's come back, his bicycle still laden with the day's newspapers. Offices closed for the holiday. Deliveries can wait another day. A brother's in the bathroom, another awaits his turn. Soon we'll all have baked and dressed in our Christmas best, ready for church, a quick walk away. Um, okay, let's, um, this poem is entitled Order of You on page 46. Order of you, happy Valentine's Day. It's not the fragrance of you I desire. It's not, it's the raw odor of you I drink deeply. The musk and pure sweat of you. In inhaling you, I am drunk to dizziness. Klein and Givinci can keep the falseness of your body scent they smother. <clears throat> Their sweetness is not you. On page 92, Words for the Lonely. With this worldly worn out smile, he said, when the day breaks, smile and say you are super well and that the coffee was bitter the way you like it. Don't mention the empty milk carton in the fridge. When the day draws on, enjoy the quiet though you miss the companionable silences. When you lunch alone, take heart. All at the next table are looking at their devices. When back home, chat with all those names on your screen, though you know they are nobody saying nothing. When alone in your king size bed, suffice for three, you now can spread bedtime books and mobile phones. When sleep comes crawling, you can still dream him into your arms, though not your heart. Don't wake up too early. Things are said, page 64. I gently lift your arm that holds me close against you. You do not know that I have risen and have moved away from you. The room chills my body and I remember I am naked. In your sleep you held me, but I had lain awake in your warmth. The night of love making had worn you out. But I had lain awake, thinking, he did not say, I love you.
page 51, transitions. Transitions. Monogamy slides into open relationships, slips into time-sharing partnerships. The old line, I won't fall in love, I will come home to you. Um, page 102. Kitchen view. You stand singularly straight, a whiteness among the green. Your petals unfurled now strike outwards, each firmly hold its own. As the day draws on, you are in fullness. Then slowly you recede into yourself to a tightness. Your respite is brief. And with the new morn, you, you replay your loveliness. A crowning show, then no more. Your once straight stem now lies slant and soft. Beauty spent, now still. In the water, the guppies nibble and shelter while you waste away. Page 99, 20 years on. Twenty years on, I pass the place you and I once shared, and there it stands as it stood then, a solitary wooden building and the sea beckoning. The years have worn it down, as has your face blurred with each passing year. I am suddenly hit by the sanitized smell of bleached bed linen, washed, starched, ironed, and spread on our bed. Clean linen in an inexpensive hotel. A mosquito netting hangs round the bed, keeping us in and them out. All the time, the all-seeing fan drones on. Two lie on a bed, and eternity passes. One lies awake for a long touch that was never to be. I'll just read one final poem <clears throat> on page 37, going back to Brickfields. Page 37, uh, 37 is called Boy Food Street Buffet. Awaking to the smell of Amma's brewed coffee, I could choose roti baka with margarine and kaya from a Chinese coffee shop, cream puff and bread from nearby Central Bakery, sometimes roti chana soaked in dal curry for breakfast. The ice cream man makes his round about noon with a spin on his wheel of fortune we could win a few ice cream sticks, but we rarely did. We are spoiled for choice as the day draws on. The soup me man arrive, announces his arrival, clicking on short bamboo sticks on a bicycle drawn cart, serving noodles in hot fishball soup. More bicycle bells. It's our neighborhood Indian quay seller on his route with bondas, vadas, curry puff. Evening soon comes upon us, and the air is filled with the blare of the roti man's bicycle horn. 
what an array of delights to choose from. If not coconut bun today, then surely tomorrow. Amma serves out her rice and curries by eight. And then, at night we hear the sound of the old power bands, bicycle bell, visions of kachang, kaya, and cha siu pao. Still, there is some, still there is some room for, for Milo and cream crackers. And then, good night. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And uh, a pleasure to hear uh, the poems read uh, so beautifully. Uh, Quina, shall we, we pass over to you to get okay. some reflections? Well, Mr. Ma, I would like to thank the Lang Institute for inviting me here and all of you in the audience for giving your hear me speak maybe some nonsense <laughs> and I'm also surprised by, by Edwin and also and flattered that he asked me to comment on his poems. Now bear with me as I struggle with my glasses, this book and my paper and my chicken scrap scrap scratches on my paper. Anyway, I'll I'll say that I will say something which will surprise Edwin himself. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> despite some, of course there are some weak poems in the collection, he doesn't know that he that he's a better poet than he thinks. At first, my first reaction when I looked at, at, the, at his book, well, indeed, I wanted to destroy him. But as I read on and on and on from cover to cover, the tone of the poems catches up with me. And I found that despite the simplicity, you know, it's some, I mean, at first sight, you might say, even a child can write these poems, they're so simple. But the simplicity is a very subtle and I think deceptive one. Because beneath all that surface simplicity, you will see a poet who is extremely sensitive to time and change. And a loss that comes thereof. And indeed, I think you'll be surprised. But, uh, when I say that he is more Buddhist and Taoist than a Christian. Because I, I think as far as the fundamental thing about Buddhism, Buddhism is that nothing stays the same, it changes. It, the only is constant is change. And life, I can only use the Indian word, is dukkha, which is not really translatable into English. Some have translated pain, sorrow, some the unsatisfactory, and this and so on. But I think maybe an approximation to, to the meaning of Dukkha is that it is, uh, it's like a wheel that is out of kilter. So it's not, that's not quite, not quite work. Because all living things are born grow old and uh, eventually they die. Alright? And also, as the Buddha says, I'm not a Buddhist, but I'm just <laughs> trying, trying to say this in connection with Edwin's problems, that even in pleasure there is dukkha, because it passes on and so on. And also, this has something in common with the Taoists. And although he's worried about being something too Indian and uh, being trapped in his own Indian culture and so on. The other thing I would want to say is that he's got a lot in common with the classical Chinese poets. 
And uh, one of the main themes in Chinese, uh, classical Chinese poetry, up to the 18th century and so on, is this very deep consciousness of time. And in fact, one of his poems there about the, the, the flower growing and in fact, that is such a poem in, in, in Chinese. And the poet, see, in, in his case, it's a peony. And the poet seeing that the, the flower, you know, as I think in China, yes, you know the peony, peony is white in the morning and it grows red and it, 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 it wilts and becomes black and, and so on. And the poet actually weeps at that. Not just for the sake of the flower itself, it just said he weeps for all living things. All living things born, grow, flourish, and then they die. All right. But the, there is a difference in between Edwin's reaction to time change and, and loss. And that is in the case of the Chinese poets, because their, uh, their environment was, the cultural environment was such, they could give up sort of positions in public life and so on. And in their case, they leave the emperors or the warlords court and go back to, to, to live a simple life. And one of the greatest poets in China, Tao Yuan Ming or uh, uh, Tao Chuan, he just gave up his position at court and went back and cultivated the Buddhist simple Taoist life. And in his words, he went back to the to cultivate an acre or two in the wilds. And there was uh, the other one, uh, Chu, Chu, uh, what is it? Chu Yuan, who suffered, and then he lived during the, the warring times. And he just disagreed with his king and told the king that he is against war and so on. So much so that the, the king got angry and banished him. And of course, in his banishment, he was so disappointed and frustrated, he committed suicide. Do you know that the, the, the Zheng Fest festival every May, that is in honor of him because he jumped into the river and drowned himself. And uh, the Chinese made all these dumplings to, to feed him and, and the gods to do everything. So there are numerous Chinese instances of Chinese poets who, who, who are aware of time and loss and so being, being mainly Taoist, some of, later on some of Buddhists when Buddhism came to China in the 7th century, they see that ambition and life in, in the world and was, was, was a vanity, all right? But in Edwin's case, of course, he's in the modern environment. So he's trapped, I suppose, in where he, where he is. And so he, his reaction is a, a different one in the sense that, if I may check my thoughts. This comes
what it was, but totally, in, totally incapacitated so that she could not sort of communicate with the, even with the phone, her family and her own son. And Edwin's reaction is indeed complicated and complex. And then, first of all, you have, I, I think you can check, check the book later on. I think uh, the reaction of us, slight shock on finding the, the, the mother in that condition. And maybe even as, uh, as a bit a uh, horror, so mixed up with a sense of love for the mother. And to see her in a state where she could not uh, respond to, to, to her own family approaching her and had to be dressed up by the daughter to be prepared to church. And also made, not intentionally, but made as if she was an adult and, and, and dressed. And so his reaction also was one of pity. And also, when he tried to speak to the mother, and uh, the mother said, what? Yara. Uh, what? Yaro. Yaro. What does it mean? Whoever. Uh, yeah. It could be anyone. And during that, that episode, I think, uh, there was some slight hope that she could communicate with me. All right? And also, to see the mother in that state, I think sometimes he also felt he was in a state of denial. All right? And then also there was also some guilt mixed with the love. Thinking when he is away, he thinks that, well, we should the mother die. She wouldn't know anyway if he doesn't come back and so on. And then uh, the, the mother, was she living too long? Was she there? She was, did, she, she, did she stay alive for the sake of, is it the selfishness of the family in keeping her? Life. So, I think that is why the book is, the collection is appropriately named as complicated. It's very complicated, right? And then you go, and then of course there are the, the, the poem about the father, who I think is the one that rooted him, right? because of his relationship with the son and so on, and then about his brothers. And then there were the Brickfield poems about the, about the happy childhood. And this relates back to the theme of loss. Right? To, as a, but my own personal view is that these are the weaker ones because in the Brickfields, in the Brickfields poems, there is too, too much recital of things and events and so on. Whereas in the mother poem, you can see one image which strikes horror, pity, and love, and guilt all at the same time. So the mother poems in that section are very, very powerful poems. So in, in that, uh, and I think it works because of the tone. Good, the, the, the simplicity is not because it's simple-minded, but it is given it makes the whole thing, I think, clear, objective, and authoritative without sentimentality. I think that's the main thing. No sentimentality in that. It just, under the surface, you have all these kind of reactions. Right? Now, all, in, the second sec in the second section, I think it's about mainly, I wouldn't say romantic, but sexual. And it's also a theme of time, change, and loss. When, when people meet, boy and girl meets the first time, of course they fall in love with them. And so on. I don't know whether it's a pessimistic view of life and so on. Eventually, love turns to. Alright? Love, uh, maybe, not this, uh, maybe disappointment or alienation and actual loss. And then people. We become tired of each other and love becomes not a, a single person but a, a sort of a cynical one with a, a sort of a, I mean that the, the sexual relationship continues in a casual way and many others. So in that sense, the love poems 
Uh, it's also powerful in that sense, you know, in a, as a, a group with a lot of poems. And in the third group, it's a miscellaneous uh, social comment, and some of the poems are straight. But I find the most powerful poems among the last ones about getting getting old and eventually dying. And, and in that group is the, the poem about the flower of Israel. And in fact, the very last ones to me are the most powerful ones. Unobtrusive, simple, and yet if you if you read it with your with attentiveness to the tone, the tone is completely objective. It's like what it, it, it is like a pure philosophical statement, without embellishment, without sort of as I, I use the word sentimentality. The last few poems are worth reading again and again. And uh, I think one of the poems he, he, he read, the boy and girl, a Chinese girl and Indian boy. I don't find that very good because it's more like a ministry of unity poem. <laughs> so, in a sense, on the whole, I think Edwin is a much better poet than he realizes. And he works on this, this simplicity of tone. And that's where I think where the risks are, in the sense of if we work on this, this uh, so called, I mean, this, this outer simplicity, it is as if you are walking on a tight rope. And if you succeed, you reach the other side, of course, you are a hero. And, and of course, a great poet. But if you don't succeed, you fall off the rope. The, 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 the rope. You end up with another weird poems. So I, I will not go on, into, go on into the details, but you know each other poems that are very strong ones, where he's a better poet than he realizes. The mother poems in the first section, and then the poems of uh, betrayal, uh, the, the love, love uh, change from at first romantic love into sexual love, be, into betrayal, disappointment, and, and in fact alienation of the lovers from one another, and then is it descent from marital love, Casual love with a number of others. And finally, I find that the last poems, uh, the, the one on meditation on uh, uh, advancing age. And in fact, I would say that I think the title and uh, on reaching 58, on reaching 60, those I would say are Taoist poems. <laughs> <laughs> Now they are you are better poet than you realize. You. you are more a Chinaman than you also realize. <laughs> Chinaman in disguise, yeah. And I think that's about all that I have to say. Uh, unless you ask me questions, uh, I'll respond. Well, I'm absolutely sure people will ask you questions. So, Edwin, the first lesson to draw from this very public critique. I mean, that must be quite scary. That's the high wire act of listening. Because you have no idea what this uh, very severe critic may or may not say. Uh, but you have to change your introduction. It's absolutely not a, about Indian identity and so on. In fact, you're, 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 you're grasping at univer very interesting universals. Uh, but Queen Anne has actually put place you in a Buddhist Taoist box uh, <laughs> from which there is no escaping from the seventh or ninth circle of hell you, 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 you entered. I very much also took uh, from my reading of, of the collection uh, this simplicity of tone, indeed of language. You don't indulge in any great verbal pyrotechnics, for example. And yet we all know you as a, as a, as a scholar, a gentleman. Uh, a sophisticated man. So that must have been a very conscious decision uh, to go along uh, the high wire act that we uh, described. Uh, 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about I think them? he doesn't know it. That's where the Oh, story right. Is. If you know it, then... Yeah. Don't lose your innocence, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the poems about... The mother poems were actually written about 15 years ago. And I've been working on them for a long time. And in fact, the whole idea was to present some very raw emotions without being sentimental. Uh, my mother actually, uh, by the time she died, she had dementia, but before that she already had Alzheimer's and all. So you could actually see a very vibrant person slowly losing her fat, her control over her body and her, her mind and, and uh, reacting and coming to terms to that was a very painful process. So the, yeah, and I think that come, that's what I was hoping to present. And the, actually the poems were not published for a long time because I was afraid that I will offend my siblings. Because it is a very complicated relationship that emerges there between the, the child and the mother. So I, I remember when I had two of my short stories published, I had people coming to me and saying, why did you present us this way? I said, I wasn't talking about you, it's fiction. But they said, the Indians did come on very well in your two short stories. <laughs> and I, I, again, you know, this idea that uh, uh, whether you, you write something uh, which might create controversy, and, I, and so when I made a decision that I was going to actually publish this volume, I actually spoke to my eldest brother who there's a poem about him. And I actually told him, you know, I'm going to publish my poem. He said, if you have started something, finish it. So I took it as, yes, it's going to be fine. And nobody has ostracized me over the last few months. So in fact, uh, it was, it's been very, that, that part came up very nicely. and. Uh, so, so that had, those poems actually went through many rounds of writing, and I think that helped. And the most of the other poems tended to come out from various experiences, either personal or my, or those who I live with, uh, who share their views, uh, and therefore uh, again. Uh, the sense of loss, different kinds of loss. You could be in a relationship and still have lost that which you once had. And um, a lot of time people remain in a relationship. That's why I said it. This tangling is not possible. So you just make do with what you can. Yeah. The poem that actually uh, that Poena was talking about called Kitchen View, uh, the persona looking at this flower is something that I wrote and I, I actually liked it because it worked in so many levels and and, I, and I, when I looked at it one day I said it's also so sexual if you look at it if you, you know um, I either have a very dirty mind or it just works in different levels but um, and right after I wrote that poem I wrote another poem which also worked on that, which was uh, the one which is called The Blackbird. What's the name of it? Blackbird 101. Yeah, I'll read that to you. A lone black bird sits on the water lily pot. He sits there with a familiarity, a welcomed guest, more than the brightly colored robed feathered fiend that feeds on my fish. He sits silent, aged, tired, no desire to drink. His head turns. Has he heard a sound? Have I not moved? Still he sits. He is in no hurry. 
but the world beckons. There is, there is little time for a black feathered friend who might have come to say goodbye, and I need to say thank you. So these two poems actually came about the same time, and I was actually thinking of writing a series of poems about this, along these lines about loss. So yeah, and you know, uh, whether consciously, I, I think when I write, I I do like the idea of stripping it down to as bad as possible. And I remember an advice a friend of mine gave. He said, "Look at the word. If it's if you can get rid of it, then it doesn't have to be that." Same things, yeah. Whereas the Brickfield's poems, I, I, I believe, yeah, the narratives tend to be a lot of things being thrown at you, and that could be immersion. You know, like I often tell my students, the poem is the last draft, so I. So you like to go back, you know. In, in fact, there's a poem called A New Road. And I think that poem, I actually published it in 1997 or something. And when I went back to it, I said, oh, good grief, how did I publish that? And what it's now is so different from what I first wrote. And, and I think the whole idea that the, it never ends. I think people like Chris Jarrell rewrote their novels God knows how many times. And you were writing a 15 line poem, and I think all the more reason why you should be working with them. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to open it up to questions or comments or reflections uh, from anyone. And indeed, not only to Edwin, but also to uh, Queen Anne's own uh, critical reading of, of the collection, which I, I found fascinating. We're a small group, so there's no place for shyness. And certainly there's no way to hide. I have a comment. Uh, please don't take the mess. No worries. Um, I don't know you and I don't know your poems. And today's the first time I've met you. Such a cheerful person, laughing and very young. But the poems are definitely Dukkha for me. They, there's a deep sadness in them all the time. Like, um, like remembering, but not remembering with too much joy. That's my comment. Thank you. <laughs> well, the absence of a redemptive quality mm. to the poems. I mean, there is no ease or, you know, uh, a moment of uh, enlightenment or even... So it, it's, it's almost like a Proustian, uh, you know, remembrance of things past, but past the patina is always about loss. Mm. And indeed cynicism. Queen Anne, I think, suggests in some of those poems a certain level of cynicism, a certain level that redemption is actually impossible. It's not even worth searching for. Yeah. And perhaps that's also something that we can pick up. But I think from the last point, on old age, approaching 58 and 60, <laughs> that is the sense of acceptance yeah. and therefore some kind of peace. Right. That is a bit, when you go back and read those, the last three or three or four points, those are the ones. But in that same poem, if I may just interject, he also says that He's got lots of things yet to be done. Yeah. There's his bucket list, you know, everything. <laughs> it's not me for me. So I would never get to do this, and I have, I have no yearnings for them. Yeah, finally he comes to terms, terms with it. And I was, when I read this at 58, I was reminded of uh, words, words, poem of intimations of immortality, but this is mortality. <laughs> <laughs> In dimensions of mortality, and uh, also, you know, a little bit of Robert Frost there, miles and miles to go, you know, before he, 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 I think the boy is uh, stopping by woods on a snowy, on one snowy evening, 
So at 58, this is at 58. So it, it is, as you said, middle-aged, uh, Garrett said, it's already starting to think of death. Right. Well, Lila said 58, 60, that's still young. <laughs> See, I want no new beginnings. Yeah. I begin to yearn for still. Yeah. That's initially, now, now initially uh, he says no, he's got lots of things to do. Yeah, that's right. But finally, realization dawns and he says, okay, and the I'll keywords, say let him go. I am letting go. Yeah. He thinks he has to let go. And the present will suffice. So he wants to make the best <coughs> of the present. That That's what is uh, actually exactly. essential Taoist philosophy. Oh, also. Live in, in, in fact, Buddhism. Be mindful. Be mindful means know exactly what's happening around you. Notice things around you. Live in the it, present. Exactly. But I picked up a, a different poem from that last sequence. Uh -huh. And the last lines of which read, which once, uh, this is called uh, call back time, <laughs> and the deep, almost a bit resigned shrug, which comes from arriving at 60. But look at the last three lines of the final stanza. Once, you know, once we knew our bodies, now they seem to turn against us, mocking us with dread and despair. I mean, this is not a man who necessarily <laughs> sees any sense of acceptance. Yeah. But it's a recognition. Yeah. And in, rec in recognizing that, the next step is non-attachment. Oh, well, that's very good. Oh. <laughs> that's why Edwin never sends emails, because he has no attachments. <laughs> That's why it's so, the poem is so good. Excuse me, may Sure. You use the word yeah, a revisit poem. That means it's not published until you are satisfied. What is it that satisfies you in the end after writing something? Ah, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The mother poems. In a journal by uh, the in, in UIA, Prof. Kayum is the editor, and he uh, sent out the poems to different reviewers, and they came back. And based on some of their comments, uh, I accept some of it unchanged, and he published them. And then when I was going to publish my anthology, I actually reworked again on some of the poems. Um, the I and sometimes the feedback that you get might help you because you might agree with them. One of the there were two reviews. One of them said, "Would you like to flash it out further?" And I said, "No, I'm trying to reduce it." <laughs> you know? So you don't always have to agree with what someone says. But when do you? I don't think I ever. No, maybe that's not right. I think there, there is a point where you are happy as how it is because it is saying exactly what you, that you want. And in some sense, validation from your readers helps you to come to terms that maybe just let go now and let it be. Ten years from now, you look at it and say, well, you know, that's how you felt then. I'm not sure if I'll reach 70, but if I do, maybe 60 would have said, oh, did I really think of that then? But because in the next poem that I have, that or it will be says, I've let go of everything. You know. So it's something that I actually believe and um, I, I subscribe to the, that. I, I think that if I die today, I would have no regrets. And maybe because I've come to accept that as uh, probably that's why these poems emerge. When you actually say, yeah, life's been good, I don't think it's going to get better, so quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Singh, yes. I have, yes, just very briefly, I think different people will have a different response to the poetry. 
the individual response. No one response is yes, yes. yes. And I think the uh, edification or the moment of enlightenment or the passage through to redemption comes in a philosophical response to the poetry. The transitoriness of life is ephemeral nature and that all things ultimately degener degenerate also. Mm. Old age, relationships can degenerate them, not necessarily, but this is one point of view from the poet's own vision where some things did not turn out as they were expected to, the, the clash between reality and appearance. So that, to me, is where uh, the edification is or the enlightenment is in that it uh, in, uh, promotes a sense of balance in, in life and to know that things are, are going to change and that I think is a very uh, 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 what do you call this uh, strengthening for the individual so because you're prepared you don't take things just as they come but you're prepared for what may happen and your poetry gives a vision of how things may turn out uh, and uh, in, with the passage of time. Thank you very much. So it's a different thing all the way. 
I think uh, uh, the philosophy, something bounces off the poetry and it's not necessarily to do with relationships. I think we can extrapolate it into other situations. For example, your relationship with society, with buildings, with lifestyles. Take Penang, for example. A lot of things have changed very positively over the last few years. The talks, forums, and so on. But one wonders whether the political situation will remain stable and whether these three positive changes will last. So that goes back to your thing of things coming to an end, sometimes things deteriorating. So I think uh, once the poet has written his poetry, uh, there is some point sometimes, okay, what did he intend? But more importantly, I think is what you make of, make of it and how it empowers you to live life more fully. And that, I think, is a positive side of it, to make you think, to make you more sensitive. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that as a reader, you take ownership of what you read. And the writer can't turn around and say, but I didn't mean it because he said, well, it's there, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Because you bring, there's a meeting between the writer and the reader, and the reader brings his own author. Right. Yeah. Like I'm sure Shakespeare meant different things to Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and what he means to us now. I think uh, spoken word 
is a genre. Uh, it's not a, a recent thing. It's been there for a while. Uh, you know, first thing is poetry is meant to be read aloud. What we're getting now is people perform performing the word. And one of my concerns is also how often are they able to say the same poem the same way without losing some of the words and stuff. Um, I think it has a place because, you know, like Ian Foster said, only connect. That connection seems to be taking place. And again, there seems to be a whole flood of spoken word activities going on. And um, Melissa Rani, uh, she's very dynamic and vibrant. And, um, and she's very involved in getting people getting, being part of that scene, which seems to be very much an urban uh, phenomenon. It, it does, it's only very much for Lumpur, maybe Penang and JB. It's, it's a very urban thing. Uh, whether the literary value is something that I, I would be concerned about. And, but I've also seen some of her work which has been published in the volume called Taboo. And in fact, uh, I have taken two of her poems from that collection to be uh, included in the compilation I'm working on. The other person is Jamal Raslan, who again is quite an interesting uh, poet, and he raises a lot of interesting issues. Uh, and I think issues alone will not be enough, but he does present it, uh, I think, in a meaningful way. So I'm, I'm glad that people are giving life to poetry, but I think at one point we will have to be concerned about whether that, how much value is it that it, that it brings to the genre of poetry. Uh, but I certainly think they are here, I'm not sure how long that's good, that phase will be, but I would certainly want to document them as present in Malaysian uh, writing. And I, I actually have three uh, spoken word poets in, in the collection. One is Sheena Baharudin. She is not, uh, it's from our earlier collection. Uh, it's not, oh, she hasn't quite gone over the other side yet. Uh, that is Jamal Rasla. And I couldn't actually uh, find, none of his books have been published. But what they were available in YouTube. So I got in touch with him and he gave me the, uh, the, the actual poems. And again, you know, there's a, the language is very mixed. You have Malay and you have English. And, and so the, the, I don't know whether I'll call them concerns, but points of interest as, as, as we look at the writing technologies. I know some people com completely uh, want to disregard them. Others have gone overboard. So maybe we have to strike a balance and see how um, a spoken word genre uh, or sharp, sub short genre continues. You know, people like Benjamin Zeph and I and all work poetry and they perform and it's, it's just that this seems to have gone slightly in a different direction. And, uh, I, I have not attended too many of these sessions. I watched them on YouTube. Uh, the other day I, I saw someone perform and I thought that she actually she actually had written it out. She had not memorized it and stuff. So, uh, I, I'm that my stand is they are here. Let's see what they can do. Um, and I don't see this all that. Like I said, if somebody has to start with Mills and Boons before they can get into uh, literary reading, well, we have to start them somewhere. Yeah. Thanks. Well, the birth of poetry is in morality anyway. Whether we go back to whichever traditions, Chinese, Indian, the Homeric tradition, and yeah. so on. Um, and I'm old enough to remember, yes, I am, uh, Ginsburg, Alan Ginsburg, doing a three hour rendition of How, How which is a poet, yeah. in Morden Tower in, in, in Newcastle. Um, 
and it was mesmerizing. But it was also equally mesmerizing on the page. Yes. Uh, and I think we shouldn't be afraid, and I think some of the spoken word poets in Malaysia sort of almost special plead, don't judge me by the same sets of standards. But I think it, with any critical gaze, you could actually legitimately ask the question, is it any good? And that's a legitimate question. I mean, if there is to be a, a critical discourse uh, around any art form, and that should include them, I don't think they should have some special pleading that they, you know, they are... Uh, no handicaps. Uh, no handicaps. And, and I, I do know, I think, uh, some of the names you've mentioned are among the younger spoken word poets for whom I have some admiration. But there's also a lot of noise and loud noise in empty room. I'm sorry, that, that, that's my own view. And I think that's partly the sort of counter-reaction of my very literate writers, translators and scholars like Pauline and, and Edin, who actually feel that uh, good quality literary poetry that at least has its first birthing on the page, that can equally well be spoken and shared uh, orally, um, is getting a bit of a bad deal and is certainly being eclipsed simply by the sort of bread and circuses of, and the light show and everything of those who speak the loudest and have the best access to social media. You know, because we live in an age of disposability and whoever makes the biggest noise and so on and so on. And I, I have some sympathy with that point of view, that good quality literary uh, poetry and, and other forms of writing. It is also interesting that a very, very successful independent publisher like Amir Mohammed or Fixie and Fame, I'm trying to persuade him that he cross subsidizes a poetry list from the very profitable uh, other books, because to me that would offer a sense of a, a holistic publisher. I mean, the days where a publisher like New Directions or Favor and Favor can have at the, at the center of the list of poetry, poetry collections, that's probably difficult to sustain. But I would see it as a job of an interesting literary publisher more generally to use fiction and, and, and the novel form, which obviously is going through a reasonably robust period in the market from what we sell at the bookshop, to cross-subsidize poetry, which will always be a minority taste, but without poetry, any culture dies. Well, you know, his latest title, which is uh, something like Basket, uh, it, it's, a, it's a new literary journal, he calls it, and in it there are I think two or three poems. So he's actually brought in poems into the collection. <laughs> two or three poems. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the thing is, um, I think everyone, oh, most publishers seem to be skeptical. And in in that sense, actually, I think Maya Press has been really good because they published Poinam, Shirley Lim, mm. uh, and a whole lot of other people. Uh, but their marketing is atrocious. <laughs> yeah, and sadly, uh, I talk that to them constantly. Uh, but what Amir has mentioned is that they won't go overboard with poetry, but they will certainly bring in more poems into the earth. But I think that also speaks to uh, the, the, the very thin terrain that is offered for poetry in the Malaysian public domain. I mean, and I'm not just looking to the usual suspects in the West where, for example, on World Poetry Day, you know, BBC Radio 4 will, will almost clear the airwaves for poets in conversation, poets doing work and so on. Arts programs will be but poets in schools on that day. Um, you know, they have laureate for, school, for schools as well as the you know, Oxford Poet. So suddenly poetry on that day and the quality is there, but Benjamin Zephaniah will be doing a particular, you know, speaking to a particular set of audiences, but so will Andrew Motion or whatever. So there's space for everybody, but there's a sense in which there's a real collective effort of will um, and poets visiting schools and so on. When I talk to Xiao Wan around the World Poetry Day, for example, 
and had in mind the idea of perhaps of one or two uh, Penang working poets visiting schools. Of course, you just run into political problems immediately. You know, you can't possibly do that at all. But it's you know we have BFM uh, who you know who offer us some cultural capital for for expressing it. But I'm comparing it even to a society like the Philippines. I taught at the University of Philippines for three years, and poetry is very, very, very alive uh, in terms of dedicated um, poetry festivals. There are all kinds of spaces uh, in which um, poetry readings take place, not necessarily of the new spoken word performative kind, but you know, uh, of maybe of a quieter uh, capability. Poets in schools, poets are simply revered as, you know, um, as emblematic of uh, the culture of the time. And we don't have that. And I wonder why. I mean, you're a professor of literature and so on, and you look back over yeah. 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 What I was going to mention was the last literary festival. Uh, there was a poetry marathon, and I thought, oh, oh, well, sit me in the big doorway so I could slip out before falling asleep. But it was such a magical show. Poetry in any shape or form, if you can get to the young people, that's a good thing. And it was just so enjoyable. It was a performance. And it was um, see, some... The people you see here are already inducted. We all already subscribe poetry. But where we really have to go is to the schools. And therein lies a major problem because uh, the teachers themselves are not ready for poetry. So the language of the English language, some of the English language teachers, uh, you know, they're not able to deal with you know, just text. If you give them something literary, they, they want you to explain it to them, well, am I with the right interpretation? Uh, so the whole mindset is a major problem. And if you, if you look at the kind of text selection that's going on, uh, I've told them that it's, it's, a, it's a mess. If, if you don't get it right with, at the school from the, where the kids are young, you know, and the problem is we're getting it wrong in English, we're also getting it wrong in Basa. So, repair is a major thing. Uh, what we do have now is a lot of private and international schools, and they seem to be a bit more responsive to this broader curriculum. Uh, they want to develop the whole child and whatever. In schools, it's a very, very challenging situation. In, in the government schools, yeah. So I, I think if you go to um, the private and international school, because they come with a different mindset, you're going to find these things happening. Uh, in the university, uh, in Nottingham, we have a creative writing program. We also have what we call Nottingham Awards where students from the other faculties come and participate in workshops of poetry and stuff like that. So again, it depends on whether the you know, what the university thinks about it. And you know, we, okay, so we are talking today about poetry in English, but what about poetry in the so-called Malay, not the so-called, in, in the Malay language, the national language, and how much support it receives, you know? Um, how many young writers do we actually see emerging? We are still talking about the old, old guards. Yeah. So. Osman Awang. <laughs> yeah, they're constantly going on about Osman Awang. Uh, and worse still, if you were uh, a non Malay writing in Bahasa, then it's like the film, you're a different category altogether. Liv Sweetin has such a difficult time, he was with us. Last year, yes. today, yeah. So, poetry is already very challenging, and then uh, we have various problems to go with it. But it'll be great, like Gareth says, if we could get poets into schools, uh, as you know, writers in residence. Uh, we've never actually gone that way because as and now with all the budget cuts, you can forget about. It. I, imagine if we had Queen on one of the campuses as a writer in residence, 
who talks with Dr. You know, you don't even have to lecture, you just be there and students come and talk to you about your work and you know, and you could then send them off to do things that would be wonderful, but it's, it's not happening. Even in Nottingham? Uh, what we do have is writers coming in very briefly. We had Shudit who come by for a couple of weeks. Uh, then we had Dunton from the Philippines. Uh, we'll be bringing in Mahesh Dattani. So we kind of connected so that they have a bigger presence. Yeah. So we do get people coming, but we haven't had a writer in residence yet. Yeah. We just started our masters in creative writing, so hopefully we'll see more things happen. No, as far as in writing in English is concerned, the difference uh, between us and the Philippines is that they are an English-speaking country. All my Filipino friends say we are Tagal Tagalog-speaking yeah, country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they accept English as an everyday language, I like here. If you speak English, write in English, you are not a You know that the Ismail Hussein, mm -hmm. the lay expert, and so on, he, he just dismissed all writings in English. He just said these are trivial writings. That's so, it. That's it. Period. Interestingly, none of the Malay books have actually achieved the kind of world standing recognition that you can. You know, um, a lot of our writers, uh, Shirley Lim received the Commonwealth Prize in 1981, then we have Tan Huan and the others. Who have, at least our young writers have a broader uh, you know, readership. And, but, but then again, they have to go to international publishers and stuff like that. We have a course called Malaysian Literature in English and we put them under the expatriate Malaysian writers. <laughs> yes, I think the, between the professor and yourself, you hit the nail on the head. Oh, really? Of course, as the professor said, it's a very challenging situation in schools. Uh, what is taught in schools, literature, poetry, I think tends to be superficial a little bit. I think they've got to push harder and go beyond the superficialities to the intellectual ideas, whether it's form 3, form 4, form 5, it doesn't matter. Uh, age appropriate, you can drop them, you can coax them, you can push them a little bit. And that, I think, is where the value of literature comes. To examine ideas, to uh, ideas, a bit of a poetry, but to dissect the poem, dissect the text, the short story, and they have got enough material in the school textbooks. Yeah. The, the thing is, is, we are talking not about the students anymore. Yes. We are talking about the teachers. Yes, I agree. I was coming to that. The teachers themselves, need, they, they don't bear without the language ability. And they have come through the same system. So they themselves are not sensitized to look for these intellectual ideas. So it is actually a vicious circle. Then you come back to what you say. It's a culture in the Philippines. They value literature. They value poetry. They value philosophy. They value the search for intellectual understanding. And that is what poetry, literature engenders in you. So unless your society values that, then I think you are at a big handicap. Now, I think, and I may be wrong here, I stand corrected. I think there's a very small band of Malaysians who value uh, literate culture, literacy, critical literacy, very small band. And then if you want, but that is a big disadvantage for admission because then there are so many, those parts of the brain have not been reached. So you've got to be like Heineken. You've got to be the kind of intellectual beer that reaches all parts of your brain. So I think. Are you going to be the brewer in chief? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we have come to the stage where we cannot wait for the government to make those changes. We push for those changes, but we don't wait for them. I think communities, families, clan associations all have got to look at the state of education and say, where can we complement? Families are very important, communities, but because our system is so exam oriented. If you sit down with a literature book, that's not coming out in the exam. Why are you wasting your time with that? Now I know of a young seed, he's in form 4, form 5 now, form 4 I think, 
loves reading. He told me I've got about 200 books at home on the shelf. I thought that's wonderful. It's so hard to find someone who values literature. But my mother has stopped me from buying any more books. You have read enough English. Now you concentrate on your exam book. <laughs> so that comes with balance. That's okay to play a bit of Pokemon. It's okay to play computer game. Balance. It's okay to watch cartoons. Also, I watch cartoons because I'm so educated. I want the good cartoons. There's so oh, much value system. Top value. Jerry. So much. <laughs> what I'm saying is, we cannot stop the young from pursuing their interests. But what we can push for is balance. And I think that is a tech we've got to use. The brood in chief has spoken. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with your viewpoint and that you are completely aware of what it is out there in the, real, in the field. Um, not easy. We were very lucky for a few months we had a uh, Deputy Minister of Education who herself was an educationist. And then unfortunately before she could do much, she, she was then uh, transferred to the higher education ministry which is of little help. So, this is a difficult thing here. Yeah. And, and, and even people think that poetry is a luxury or literature is a luxury. I had to fight with the principal of my son's school to say that, yes, he's the only one doing that paper and because I think he wants to and he should be allowed to. And she said, can you assure that he will get a distinction because we don't want our <laughs> <laughs> Like that, you know, it's very instrumental ways of thinking. I mean, to me, the, the situation is here's a, here, here's a paradox, Mr. Sin, because you said, you know, oh, we can't let the government decide on whatever. And in this particular country, yeah. I mean, the government is actually the impediment, yeah. is actually part of the major problem. On the other hand, if you're going to elicit long term sustainable change in thinking and curricula and so on and so on. We can't just leave it to the few international schools, you know, who, who represent a tiny elite, after all. Yeah, they get the elite that will... Yeah, I mean, so for our World Poetry Day event, sure, the, lang the literature teacher of Uplands, you know, brought a group of uh, young people, they said, we're going to study the, the sonnets, uh, in, 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 and so on and so on. But that's Uplands. Yeah. I mean, these are people who are spending 20000 a semester to send their kids there. So it doesn't touch on any kind of wider societal reality. But then we can't look to the government to take a lead. And I don't, I don't think it's just the Malaysian government. You know, I mean, even in a country like the United Kingdom with such a rich uh, literary or indeed historical legacy, governments also are very instrumental about what they want people to read and what they don't want to, to read what's important in history and what's... That's why if you are going through school and studying history in a British school at the moment, empire and colonialism is actually now presented in a very benign way. So, you know, when I was going through, no, you were critical about empire, you were critical about colonialism. So it goes. I mean, those are, those are trends and, and so on. I put something out there in a long, in the kind of long durée, the longer term trend. I find it very interesting that in our region, countries like not only the Philippines, I also say Indonesia, which is actually going through a post promotia renaissance in all kinds of literary forms. I mean, it's no coincidence that the Frankfurt Book Fair last year, the world's largest you know, book yeah. fair, featured as the guest of honor Indonesia, mm -hmm. and they were not scraping the barrel quality of writers who are now, and they're writing in Bahasa Indonesia, many of them, but they're getting high quality international translation work. So there's no compromise being made. Very few of them write in English. I mean, even a good friend of mine like Leila Chaguri who came, but she's still writing in Bulan. He created a huge, impressive uh, impact in Indonesia. And then naturally it was picked up by international translators and it's doing very, very well. So it's not that our language needs to be parochial simply because we're not writing in English. I think there's room and good quality translation work is vital to the good health uh, if we cross borders uh, 
uh, and so on. But what's interesting is both of those societies have come out of very deep political, well, dictatorship in both, both cases. We have to be. And in some, and it's, it's very, very, very similar. I mean, the writing that's coming that came out of Eastern Europe post the Berlin Wall, the writing that came out of Latin America after the military dictatorship. Now, of course, this is more of a, a historical sociological explanation, but there's something in it. It seems to me that those who were incubated under duress, you know, one often wonders how Iranian cinema is amongst the greatest of all world cinema at the moment, and yet. You know, the opportunities for freedom of expression are deeply constrained. So people find other creative ways of finding, you know, I think sometimes in Malaysia and Singapore or something, it's very, very comfortable. Now, I wouldn't wish us to have a hard time <laughs> under a dictator in order to produce great art, because I don't think the cor correlation is quite so simple. But I think there's something in it. I think there's something in it. My question is, are we not under duress? We're not under duress. <laughs> but you see, people, people still uh, <coughs> bathe in the luxuries of high levels of consumption, which we, we do. You know. There's a kind of softness around the society, which certainly wasn't the case under Suharto or Marx. You know, or under you know, Latin American military regimes. <laughs> What's very interesting about Indonesia, sorry if talking about it, a lot of people who were not even alive in 65, they're younger than that, they're, they're writers in their 30s and 40s, but they take 65 in many ways as the starting point for collective memory and the artistic re-representation of those memories. And I find that very, very interesting. Because, you know, of course, it's the official version, and then there's the censored version, and then there's the counter version. And this is manifesting itself not just amongst old people looking back, our generation, mm -hmm. but young people coming to grips with that quite, you know, that, that, that past, and what it signifies for their own generation. And I find that incredibly healthy, interesting. I think our young people these days in Malaysia are by and large very comfortable with their lives. They have no deep personal questions to resolve. And hence I think their philosophical motivation, uh, intellectual curiosity is somewhat a little bit subdued. So I think... There are car passing drive chasing Pokemon. That's what my, that's what my taxi driver told me. You see, that he should know. <laughs> okay, so we failed. So your son's generation can be more than me. Yeah, he's one year old. <laughs> Listen, should we should we should we call it a wrap and then we can continue over tea and whatever, but it's a little bit We were small, but we were, uh, I think, an excellent audience. And uh, I really would like to thank the Vlogvina very much for... Uh, well, I think it was a very interesting meeting with the poet, and I would push you, Vlogvina, uh, to, 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 to actually write that up, write those thoughts up from those little bits of scribbled mm -hmm. paper uh, into a very eloquent uh, essay. Uh, and for the poet who was described as well, he's better than he actually thinks he is. <laughs> Although I never quite know, I think Edwin thinks he's actually quite good. <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming up uh, all the way from, from KL. Um, we, do, we do hope you're enjoying the very poetical existence in the Royal Bin Tang. You're joining us at the Butterworth Fringe Festival tomorrow. Are any of those of you who are young, free, single and available, it should be a splendid uh, day across the water. Uh, Osaka are bringing uh, their wine, their uh, 
Kopehi glove puppet shows. There are all kinds of musicians and so on and so on. And it's about time that some grand prize took a little bit of the limelight from the island. If any of you are young, free, and single next weekend, I really, 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 and you haven't bought a ticket and you feel a little like it, Akram Khan, the great Akram Khan, who, as you can tell from his name, is British. <laughs> Either Patel or uh, Khan is uh, the, the best English British names now. But if you don't know who he is, I mean, their dance company, which represents the best of British multiculturalism. Because if you look at all his dances, oh, oh, she's Chinese, he's from South America, he, I mean, they opened at the London Olympics in 2012. I mean, they're that good. And we just happen to be bringing them to Dewan Street Penang next Friday and Saturday. That's almost like a personal thing to you. If you want to be a medalist, astonish me, as the poet once said. Uh, but there's lots going on. Um, we'll be picking up forums again in September. Let's get through August. There's plenty to get through in August. Um, and we look forward also, Edwin, that you'll be back with us in late November for the Georgetown Literary Festival, where he'll be a very immoderate moderator, apparently. <laughs> or a modestly moderate moderator, <laughs> or he'll be like Mr. Singh, the brewer-in-chief for brewing political uh, bubbles. So, shall we thank Edwin one more time?